Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Tanya Beer. I am the Associate Director at the Center for Evaluation and Innovation in Washington, D.C. We're very excited to welcome you to our webinar, uh, which is called Evaluating Social Innovation Insights from the Field. Today we're going to discuss how uh, funders and evaluators are testing out a new approach to evaluating social innovation called developmental evaluation, and how it looks in practice, and how it informs strategic and programmatic decisions. I'm joined by uh, three other presenters, um, FSG's Hallie Preskill and two panelists, John Colley, who is the Director of Program and Op Programs and Operations at the J.W. McConnell Family Foundation, which is a funder of numerous social innovations. And also we have Meg Long, who's the Deputy Director of the OMG Center and an evaluator who has conducted a developmental evaluation for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Community Partnerships portfolio. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our agenda today is as follows on the slide. And what we've asked our presenters to talk about both an overview of developmental evaluation, what it means, and how it fits with social innovation, which Hallie is going to cover. But also we want them to talk about their experience with successfully implementing a developmental evaluation. What is it that they have to learn and unlearn about evaluation practice, evaluation uh, mental models, in order to, to make developmental evaluation work. We're going to be live tweeting today using the hashtag strategiceval. We'll hope you join us on that. We're also really looking forward to a good conversation with the panelists after they've presented. And we'll be sure to leave plenty of time for Q&A. You can enter your questions anytime by typing the question into the box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. While we're not going to be able to answer all of the questions, we will try to get as many as possible, especially the questions that seem to broadly reflect the themes that we're seeing from, from all of you. So please don't hesitate to ask either conceptual questions about what exactly developmental evaluation is and how it fits with social innovation, how DE fits into a wider scope of nonprofit and foundation evaluation approaches, or the kind of concrete operational questions about what it really takes to make developmental evaluation work. We're also going to be answering additional questions on FSG's strategic evaluation blog after the event. We're very excited to hear what you think as we go. So um, first, just very quickly, I'll give a quick overview of the Center for Evaluation and Innovation. We're a small a nonprofit organization in Washington, D.C., whose mission is to try to push and develop the field of evaluation in emerging areas and areas that are complex and hard to measure. Uh, so social innovation is a very good fit for us. Um, so let's get, with, with no further ado, let's get started. I'm going to turn it over to Hallie Preskill at FSG. Thank you, Tanya. Um, it's a pleasure to be with everyone. Next slide, please. I uh, really appreciate your interest in this particular topic. Before we dive into the webinar, uh, for those of you who don't know FSG, we are a nonprofit consulting evaluation and research firm with over 100 staff spread across six offices. We're a mission-driven organization dedicated to learning through our research and practice. And whenever possible, we really work hard to translate our concepts or new ideas into useful and best practices in an effort to help philanthropic and nonprofit organizations, as well as governments and corporations, maximize their efforts to solve complex social problems. This webinar and the paper it's based on, Evaluating Social Innovation, which was released this past August and is available on both FSGs as well as the Center for Evaluation Innovation's websites, reflects a new and emerging trend in evaluation, one with that we're quite excited about. And we want to share with you today not only what developmental evaluation is, as Tanya indicated, but how this particular evaluation approach, which differs significantly from other types of evaluation, has been applied to innovative initiatives. So let's get started. Next slide, please. Philanthropic and nonprofit organizations are working tirelessly to mitigate and solve a myriad of social problems, problems such as homelessness, safe and available drinking water, global climate change, access to medicines, quality of and access to education, human rights, poverty, and the list goes on. The intransience and complexity of many of these social problems has prompted funders and service providers to think system systemically and creatively about how they might achieve their social change goals. 
These approaches include advocacy and policy change and influence catalytic philanthropy, collective impact, building and sustaining networks, building social movements, and community-driven and place-based initiatives. But oftentimes these solutions are themselves quite complex in that the path to change is unknown, conditions are unstable, multiple players act independently, outcomes are unpredictable, next steps are context-dependent, and often there are no replicable replicable models to apply. Therefore, organizations that are striving to solve complex social problems with complex solutions really require a different kind of evaluation, one that actively supports learning and decision making in emergent and dynamic, unpredictable environments. Next slide, please. So what is developmental evaluation? The term developmental evaluation was coined by Michael Quinn Patton a number of years ago but it has really gained a great deal of interest and more recently since the publication of his book called Developmental Evaluation in 2010. I want to read the definition here on this slide because I think it's really quite dense and want to think, have you think through it as I read it and think about how developmental evaluation compares to other types of evaluation with which you are familiar. So here goes. Developmental evaluation is an approach that is grounded in systems thinking and supports innovation by collecting and analyzing real-time data in ways that lead to informed and ongoing decision-making as part of the design, development, and implementation process. Thus, the developmental evaluator employs both a hard focus, which attends to anticipated outcomes as the program is piloted or implemented, as well as a soft focus, where he or she uses his or her peripheral vision, or soft eyes, to watch for unexpected outcomes, unanticipated consequences, and unforeseen changes in the system in which the intervention is being implemented. Next slide, please. We have found it really helpful to think about an intervention, a program, or initiative as having a life cycle, often one that starts with a concept and design, and then moves to pilot testing and implementation, and finally, it reaches a period of maturity of potentially sustainability. When it comes to evaluation, it then becomes critically important to match the evaluation approach to the initiative stage of life. As you can see on this slide, developmental evaluation is particularly useful at the earliest stages of design, when the innovation is being formed, when new tactics are being tried out in new places, with new populations, when there is a need to explore possible outcomes because they could not all be predicted and when it is unclear how various actors in the system will react to the intervention itself. Also on this slide, you can see that it is appropriate for formative and summative evaluations to be implemented once the program has become more stable and predictable, and evaluation then serves to refine and further improve the program, and ultimately to determine if the program made a difference in the long run. Next slide, please. Developmental evaluation is characterized by four key practices that I think you'll hear the panelists talk about in more detail. First is context analysis. Developmental evaluation explores how, why, and with what effects the project is designed and implemented, as well as how is it evolving and adapting and responding to internal and external conditions. It really seeks to understand the system in which the program lives, as well as the socio-political, economic, and cultural context. Second, developmental evaluation has embedded feedback loops in it. It collects and reports back, or the evaluator collects and reports back data to the clients in frequent and timely ways in order to inform decision making. This might be weekly, biweekly, or monthly, depending on the amount of data being collected and the ability of the client organization to process the information. Third, Learning is central to developmental evaluation, and the facilitation of that learning needs to be embedded and included at all steps along the way. So developmental evaluators intentionally build in time and space where clients can reflect on the data, ask critical questions, identify and challenge values, beliefs, and assumptions, and make programmatic and strategic decisions that are critical to the initiative success, short-term and long-term. And fourth, really developmental evaluator evaluators help the clients in a process of sense making, and that is that the developmental evaluation establishes processes that support the interpretation, synthesis, insight generation, 
and the development of recommendations using multiple forms of written and verbal communications. So sh I'm sure by now you might be wondering what does developmental evaluation look like and feel like in practice. And fortunately, um, John and Meg will have an ability right now to share their experiences with designing and implementing developmental evaluation. But first, back to Tanya. Thank you. Thanks much, Hallie. Um, we are going to move next to John Colley from the J.W. McConnell Family Foundation, uh, who's going to delve into to their specific experience testing out developmental evaluation for one of their initiatives, the Youthscape initiative. And um, I just want to say, for those who are asking, you will be able to get slides, these slides, after the webinar. They'll be available to all of you. Uh, John, over to you. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. Uh, first, I'll just give some context. Uh, in 2005, the J.W. McConnell Family Foundation launched an initiative called Youthscape, which was focusing on engaging marginalized youth. It involved seven communities across Canada and dozens of community organizations, businesses, municipal officials, and of course, young people from diverse backgrounds. So what role did developmental evaluation play in Youthscape? I think a key contribution of DE in the early stages was to shift our attention to youth-adult partnerships and organizational change within youth-serving organizations rather than simply developing youth skills and youth-led projects. In short, it helped us to adapt our theory of change and our strategy. The focus of developmental evaluation in Youthscape was ongoing learning and collective improvement, as opposed to an accountability exercise focused on judging performance. Now, why was this important? This was especially important because we were working with young people who had often been judged quite negatively by mainstream institutions. So having an evaluation process that broke this mold was actually quite important. There were several qualities of effective developmental evaluators within Youthscape. The first is they were embedded not only within the community, but often within the organization itself, instead of being parachuted in from the outside. Secondly, their participation was continuous in community activities, and not just at regularly scheduled and orchestrated events. Third, within Youthscape, the methodologies that they used, while they might have used formal information gathering methods, very often they, they had to use informal methods. So for example, they were more likely to get the scoop on what was really going on within the community by doing dishes with the young people after a community event. In summary, developmental evaluation was an essential part of the rapid prototyping approach. Data was fed to the local project team in order to take course corrections, and it was fed into a national learning community. Next slide, please. So there's three challenges that uh, I'm going to highlight and, 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 and how we address them. First, developmental evaluation is an innovation in itself. So many organizations, for many organizations, readiness is an issue. Um, one of the solutions to that is perhaps to introduce it not just as a tool that you take off the shelf and drop into a project. With partners and grantees that are considering DE, it helps to frame it as part of a larger exploration about the nature of social change, innovation, and collaboration. With our partners in social innovation generation, this foundation is undertaking research and training and provides a suite of practical supports for social innovators, one of which is developmental evaluation. The second challenge is I've often been asked by other foundations, well, where are you going to find these developmental evaluators because they have trouble finding them. Um, while it's true that the skill set is different, um, analytical skills and pattern recognition are still very important. But I think there's a real premium on active listening, emotional intelligence, and group facilitation. In other words, surfing the elephant in the room in a constructive way while you're embedded in the situation would really be an asset. Um, our solution to this within Youthscape was that we had a national coach for the community-based developmental evaluators who did not have a formal evaluation background. And on the, on the sort of uh, national scale, recognizing that we, were, we didn't really have a pool of trained developmental evaluators, we have supported the training of two cohorts of developmental evaluators by Michael Quinn Patton. Finally, and not unimportantly, is the cost of developmental evaluation. 
Um, it's our experience that a fully funded external developmental evaluator may not be affordable for many projects. Why? Well, on a conventional evaluation, you probably have a pretty good idea of you know, what the tasks are going to be. You say X number of days at X cost per day, and you can probably have a pretty good idea of what the budget will be. With developmental evaluation, it's often impossible in advance to predict what knots will have to be untangled within a project. So, for example, within Uscape, in one year, the annual budget for the National Developmental evaluate, Evaluator was used up by March 15th. However, without this developmental evaluator, we might have closed down the entire initiative after two years. I think uh, what we learned from, our, uh, from that experience was that, in fact, developmental evaluation, as Holly mentioned earlier, is very important at the front end. I would have, in fact, invested more at the earliest phases even before the project started in design and development of the project um, because you really reap what you sow. Secondly, I think as high quality tools and guides are developed, we should be able to internalize many DE functions. So uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, I think the value to the foundation uh, of using developmental evaluation is that it's very aligned with our overall social innovation strategy. Um, in addition to you know, publishing, publishing research and case studies and having webinars and things on social innovation, it's, it, it comes in very handy if you're able to actually provide practical support to grantees. It's also been indirectly, it has allowed us to contribute to the philanthropic sector in Canada and elsewhere through publications and training. For our social change organizations that we work with, I think it's provided a very useful and engaging evaluation methodology. As one of them put it, it's an intense, engaging process of co-creation, not a carbuncle that is imposed from the outside. One of the, 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 it, the Trojan horses, if you like, of um, developmental evaluation is that several grantees have mentioned that it's actually become a catalyst for becoming a more expressive organization one in which people feel that they're living the values of the organization inside their organization as well as outside and doing their work. In conclusion, I would just uh, quote Ted Chen of the Kellogg Foundation, who I think expressed it very well a few years ago when he said, we are tired of trying to prove the results of a project after the fact. We want to improve the quality of our grantees' work when they need it and in a way that is useful to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, we, we're getting some fantastic questions from the audience as you speak. Um, and just so that everybody knows, we'll tackle them all together at the end after Meg has, has spoken as well. Uh, so I'd like to turn it over to Meg, who is from the OMG Center, which stands for the Organizational Management Group, uh, the Center for Collaborative Learning. Uh, Meg, over to you. Super. Thank you, Tanya. And hello to everyone. I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation. Um, so this is uh, coming from the perspective of the evaluator, so a little bit of a different perspective from John. Um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has a very ambitious national college completion goal to basically double the numbers of low-income young adults that earn a post-secondary credential with a far fair market value. Now, yet the college access and success landscape continues to be somewhat fragmented with sort of discrete programs or policies uh, or efforts that benefit some but leave many students behind, particularly students of color and low-income and first-generation students. So recognizing the scale of the needed change, the foundation began to wonder, what would it take if an entire community bought into a college completion agenda? Who could take it on? Who could champion it? How would you get partners, like the business community maybe, districts, higher education, to work together and work together differently? So since 2009, the foundation has supported about seven cities across the country with nearly 250 stakeholders, community stakeholders, two intermediaries or coaching organizations, one the National League of Cities and the other one MDC Inc. out of Durham, and us, the OMG Center as the evaluation partner, to begin to tackle these questions together. And I want to emphasize two things here. First, we came into this with a very loose, what I would call a hunch of change. So not a theory yet, a hunch. And we, here's what it was. We need to use data. We need to build commitment. We need to change some sort of policy and practice. And we should operate through partnership. 
So the innovation here is not that this was place-based work or it was data-driven. As a field, we've seen many of those types of efforts. But it was testing the hypothesis that if you can get a whole community behind the completion agenda, the fragmentation will re be reduced and more st students can be served better. Okay. So the second point I want to make is that it's not necessarily the methods in this evaluation that distinguish it. So in preparing our budget, and I'm glad to say we did not blow our budget by March, um, but in preparing our budget, we all allocated time for site visits and interviews and meeting observations, secondary data analysis, et cetera, all the things that you would expect in a mixed method approach. What made this evaluation developmental in nature is we had intentional processes particularly during the planning and early implementation phase, to provide deliberate feedback to the sites, to the management team, which is the foundation, the technical assistance providers, and OMG. And we had processes put in place to pressure test what we were learning, make implementation adjustments, but also to adjust the evaluation plan. Next slide, please. So like John, we've been asked to sort of talk about some of the, the hiccups that we've had along the way, and I want to ch share these challenges with you um, and how we tried to address them to fuel our discussion. So similarly to John, we had to really shift everybody's mindset about what this evaluation would and would not tell us. And this really created some creative tension, but also some role blurring. So this was not about discovering the ideal partnership model. This was also not about uh, reporting on the number of students who are receiving a credential, or even telling the sites how well they're progressing vis-a-vis -vis others or some model, which you'll hear about in a second. And truthfully, the more ambiguous and the more complex and broad-reaching an initiative, the more we all want to know how are we doing? Are we doing the right thing? Are we meeting expectations? So it was difficult for all of us, the management team, the sites, the partners, first of all, to understand that this is really a different approach. And then honestly, to remember that at this stage, the only expectation that was governing this work, particularly early on during the planning and early implementation phase, is that we want to test a variety of approaches under different conditions to figure out how we can get to the long-term end goal of doubling the numbers best. So we addressed this issue through a lot of deliberate, frequent, and persistent shared reflection um, that both helped us remember what this community partnerships work was about, but also allowed us to showcase the depth of what we l were learning, to really show the value add. Um, and that we were moving towards a model that in all likelihood we would be able to say has a, it will have ultimate impact. This is why I often, when I think about developmental evaluation, I often think about it as sort of the R&D, if you will, the research and development of the social sector. And that is we're trying all sorts of approaches to find the ones that we think, based on gathered evidence, will lead to the greatest chance of success. So the second idea was to use your theories. Okay, so the community partnerships work was not about testing an idealized model, as I mentioned. The only elements of the theory of change were those four buckets, commitment, data, partnerships, policy, and practice, which basically provided some parameters for this work. So the portfolio was not a rudderless ship entirely. We all had a direction that we were heading. But the real R&D began to take place as sites began to interpret the work based on their individual context, their knowledge, and test some of their own assumptions, some that played out and others that did not and required mid-course corrections. And I can tell you we had many corrections over the course of this work. And that's a good thing. Some of these were in, in reaction to contextual changes. Our role as evaluators was to reduce the ambiguity in that theory of change to begin to clearly articulate how this change is happening in different contexts. And I do want to say, just like the theory of change, we have basically changed every single element of our evaluation plan in concert with, with what we are learning from the work on the ground. We've dropped methodologies. We've introduced new ones. We've introduced new questions and new measures. And we continue to both identify and measure outcomes simultaneously. Nothing is sacred in our evaluation approach. And all these changes are made as transparently as possible with both the management team and the sites. Finally, I do want to say DE is messy, it's fast-paced, it's complicated, and it requires a skill set well beyond just content and methodological expertise. 
we've found to make it work, you need a team with both sharp facilitation skills, but also expertise and ability to identify informal systems, power dynamics, strong advising aptitudes, and the persistence in face of ambiguity. Because if there's one thing for certain, flexibility is critical if we're going to continue, continuously learn. So despite all this ambiguity, it's also very critical to address this by making sure that as the evaluation partner, you are explicit what role you are playing at what point in time. Are you testing some ideas or are you providing evaluative feedback? Are you simply playing the role of facilitating a conversation among stakeholders? It's important for folks to know how you will collect information and how will you will be using it. Next slide, please. So D is not for the faint of heart. I have to tell you this has been an exceptionally rewarding evaluation. It's stretched my personal and our team skill set. It's also generated some important lessons for the field and created important adjustments that we think will lead to increased likelihood of success across sites. But I have to say maybe the most important way uh, that D has contributed is true innovation is a scary and lonely place to be. You're really out on a limb. And I think that this developmental evaluation approach that we've engaged in, while it doesn't reduce risk taking, it does create a set of authentic partners that are championing the work together and making the risks inherent in innovation just that much more palatable. Over to you, Tanya. Excellent. Thanks so much, Meg. Uh, I am kind of astounded by the number of different interesting questions that we have uh, to grapple with as a panel. So I'm going to try to cluster them together. Um, and again, our apologies if we don't get to your specific question. We're going to spend some time on the, on the FSG blog afterwards answering the questions we can't get to today. Um, so first I want to start with a question for John. Um, We've had quite a few questions from the audience about this idea of a feedback loop. Um, both what does it mean to have continuous versus episodic feedback, and, and what happens when feedback uh, closing the, the, the data loop you know, from gathering data out in the field in those real-time situations you mentioned, like washing dishes with folks, how does that kind of data and information get fed back? And what, what kinds of considerations do we as evaluators, funders, and nonprofits have to have for the right timing for that kind of a feedback loop. You might not know. You're on mute, John. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm back. Um, okay, so the first part of the question was the difference between episodic and continuous. Um, from my experience, it, many evaluations are, you know, set out that there will be a, a scheduled time for reflection or focus groups or interviews or whatever. Um, you know, and, and often based on a schedule set out, not necessarily co-created by the people in the community. Um, we know that in complex, messy community type of projects, um, things happen, you know, uh, in our project, for example, young people and adults, uh, the young people challenging the adults that the, the norms of, you know, respecting different points of view or whatever are not being, are not being respected. And sometimes it may not be a direct challenge. It's if you aren't in the room seeing the kind of subtle messages, you might not pick it up. So the continuous part is you're there not only for regularly schedule, scheduled orchestrated events, but you're there to observe what's going on and actually just help people by holding a mirror up to them around what is going on. Now, the second part of the question, the feedback loops, is very important because you could see that this could be quite controversial if not handled well. So the example of the dishes, you know, the young people over, you know, in the dish, doing the dishes are actually grumbling about something that's going on but are too polite or whatever to bring it up through more formal mechanisms. So now you're in a delicate position. How do you deal with, there have to be rules of the game, if you like, about how developmental evaluators will feed things back into the system. Otherwise, they can actually create a lot of enemies within both the, the uh, community organizations that are, are, are going to process that information. So the first point is it is getting processed locally, not to the funder. It's actually being, it's being fed back to the people who can take course corrections. But there have to be, if you like, negotiated ways by which people will, you know, 
respectfully feed that back into the system and respect the fact that while they are information gatherers, not to overstep their bounds, and while they are embedded and engaged, somebody else actually has responsibility for making those course corrections. We had an added twist within Youthscape in which the local developmental evaluators in each community were actually feeding through a national developmental evaluator who was on the one hand their coach and on the second hand feeding things, if you like, to our, our strategic backbone organization as well as to the foundation for us to make course corrections at a higher level. Excellent. Thank you, John. And, and it brings to mind you know, one of the other things that we Hallie and I discovered during our research for the report, and in fact several folks have pointed out in their questions, um, is also the, what, what distinguish, this idea of what distinguishes a developmental evaluator from just a good facilitator. And you know, one of the things that we found is that there's quite a spectrum of folks practicing developmental evaluation. Um, and the idea of having more systematic ways not only to collect data through both informal and formal methods, um, but also more systematic ways to figure out that closure of the feedback loop so that groups can make sense together of the data and figure out its implications for their next steps um, was definitely something we learned uh, quite a bit from the folks that we interviewed. Um, which actually relates to, to the next question I'd like to, to pitch to Hallie. Quite a few people have asked about both organizational readiness and evaluation capacity. What, what, what are some of the bare minimums that need to be in place for funders or nonprofits to be able to take this on? Um, and also, does it work in different kinds of contexts better than others? Um, for example, in developing countries, what sorts of, of situations should evaluators and funders think about before they put DE into action. Great, thanks. Boy, that, there's a lot there. And um, I also think I'll tack on a response to several people have asked about where they can learn more about developmental evaluation, because I think it kind of fits here. And I'll mention a couple things about that as well. Um, so I think this, it, this question around um, the capacity and what's the readiness for developmental evaluation is very, very important. Um, and so, <clears throat> excuse me, in our uh, white paper, Tanya and I actually have uh, outlined some conditions what, uh, for what we think requi uh, developmental evaluation requires. So when we think about capacity, there's, there are two ways to think about it. One level of capacity on the funder side, and then there's other kinds of capacity on the organization um, side in terms of who's providing the data. And so um, we think actually there needs to be this capacity at both levels. So there needs to be, first of all, the initiative itself must be developmental. So this is not really for a program that's already been designed and implemented and the outcomes are clear or at least we're working towards those outcomes and you kind of can predict and the environment is, is stable enough to know whether or not those outcomes are achievable. So developmental evaluation is for an initiative that is an innovation where things are just unclear enough to know that we have to test and work our way, live our way into um, this initiative and what it has and its potential. And the, in terms of what's the, the infrastructure of the organization to support this, clearly it has to have effective leadership that's willing to take risks, that is willing to entertain possibilities of failure or missteps or taking the wrong path. Uh, it requires a leadership that is willing to be flexible and make the necessary changes to the initiative in real-time ways to act on the information that's coming in. And that's leadership at different levels within the organization. Um, the second uh, aspect of readiness is the, what we call the values and culture of the organization, so that the organization really needs to be a learning organization in many ways. Um, it's always a, you know, I think organizations are always in the process of becoming a learning organization, so it's hard to achieve its nirvana. But nonetheless, it needs to support innovation and continuous learning and build in space and opportunities and practices where people can come together and reflect on and actually learn, change their behavior, change their thinking, or at least to confirm some of their thoughts with, with data around uh, the initiative and what it's uh, doing. And that, that culture needs to be adaptive and so allow people to adapt their practices and their thinking to the initiative and in real-time ways that make a difference. The third aspect of readiness is resources. As you've heard both our panelists talk about this, um, as any evaluation, requires um, sufficient number of uh, time and people and, and money for an ongoing inquiry. And some of you have asked about how long does this take? And if you think about that time continuum, 
on slide six. Um, it really um, it, it depends, of course. But if you think about if you had a five-year initiative, uh, one way to think about it is how long you're going to be in the design phase where you're trying to explore and test things out. Maybe that's six months to a year to 18 months. And then as, it, as things become more stable and knowable and the outcomes are being clearer and the path is becoming a little bit more understandable, then maybe it moves into formative evaluation where you spend um, another year to two years refining and improving, tweaking the program. So it is definitely going to achieve its outcomes as much as you can anticipate. And then you would think in the fourth to fifth year, you would be in a more summative evaluation stage. But in terms of developmental, it really does require a, a fair amount of resources and, and time for people to engage. And we'll talk about the capacity thing in a moment in terms of time. And then finally, communications. Um, you, you, information can only get used if it's shared and if there's a process for distributing and, and acting on that information. So there need to be mechanisms and channels for sharing um, that information, making it accessible, and ensuring that it can be used both internally and externally. From a capacity standpoint, we, Tanya and I talked a lot about who, who makes the changes. Um, it's developmental evaluation for whom. So if a funder commissions the developmental evaluation, how do the grantees um, actually implement the changes that are being found as important. And John's example speaks to this very clearly. Um, so there has to be a capacity of the grantees to actually course correct, make the adjustments, adjustments uh, be adaptive uh, based on the data. As well, um, there's an issue around capacity for actually using the information. Um, in one of our recent experiences with developmental evaluation, the client actually asked us to not provide so much information. They couldn't process it more quickly enough. And so we had to adapt to that as well. So there are different kinds of capacity. In terms of evaluation capacity, because I think that was part of someone's question or some folks, um, I don't think there has to be a lot of evaluation capacity on the, on, on the part of the organizations, but they need to be willing to engage and learn from and about the evaluation process. Um, as long as, I think, importantly, clearly the, the evaluators need to have evaluation capacity for developmental evaluation in particular. In terms of different contexts, um, I, I think we landed on the idea that a developmental evaluation can occur in any context, any kind of global context, any type of local context, um, community context, uh, federal context, uh, and um, that really it, it just depends on more of these readiness conditions, whether or not it's going to be successful. Um, and finally, those of you who want to learn more about developmental evaluation, um, you could check out uh, something called the Evaluators Institute. Um, they have a website, and Michael Quinn Patton does a workshop um, um, during their workshops at least two or three times a year. The other place is the American Evaluation Association that offers workshops prior to the year's conference. Uh, we just finished the last conference in, uh, a couple weeks ago, and the next one will be next October in Washington, D.C. And then, John, you might know if the Tamarack Institute offers um, workshops on uh, developmental evaluation. Um, but the first two are, are, are um, U.S.-based organizations that do provide some training on DE. Back to you, Tanya. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. And Hallie, your response makes me think, too, you know, we had a couple questions about reporting and communications to close uh, the feedback loop that John was talking about. And, you know, one of the things that your response makes me think of is how uh, uh, the conventions of evaluation, our, our standard evaluation practices that we've set up over kind of years of doing this, such as, you know, you provide an evaluation report every six months, um, or the, the final product is a formal report, that DE requires a lot of rethinking some of those basic conventions, that perhaps the, the best way to feed back information into a system, into a group of decision makers, isn't a formal report. Maybe your, your verbal exchanges and brief presentations at the right moment become a, a more effective way to feed back information. And so maybe resources should be redirected from large formal reports to more, episode, or more periodic, uh, faster, easier to communicate methods. Um, those, those kinds of lessons I kept learning over and over again about what we had to unlearn uh, about our evaluation practices. Right. If I could just add one more thing, Tanya, I think you're absolutely right. And um, there are lots of innovative or creative ways, such as learning briefs, um, one-page memos, to uh, capture some of the conversations and the lessons learned to date. 
Um, I still think for, for a lot of organizations, they're, they're going to want or need some kind of summing up report about what has been learned um, at the end of a six-month period or end of a year period. And while those cert certainly um, shouldn't be 50-page, 100-page technical reports, there are some ways to frame a report that captures the learning. And I think there's been a wonderful example from Jamie Radner, who's been working with the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard. And um, they've conducted a developmental evaluation. And their report um, was, I think, well, I'm not, I can't remember how many pages, but not, not terribly long. But they identified a set of questions that they uh, addressed through the report. And I'd just like to give a couple of them, because I think it gives um, webinar participants an, an idea of the kinds of things one would report. So for example, the first question that they seek to answer in this report is, what has been developed by the initiative to date? What has been done, and in what ways is it significant? Another question, what has been discovered about how to assess progress now and ongoing forward toward the initiative's core goals? How does it match up with what's expected? Um, another one, what ex uh, from a systems perspective, what unexpected patterns or outcomes and what adaptations in planned activities emerge during the year? What lessons applicable to the initiative's ongoing work can be harvested from this experience? And there are a couple others. So you can see it's a very different kind of framing for an evaluation report. Excellent. Thank you. That's a great resource, too. Uh, okay, so Meg, let me let me add a question for you now. Um, first of all, could you just very briefly reiterate for folks what makes DE different than than formative evaluation and participatory research and things that look look like evaluations that are about feedback loops and and refining and and uh, decision making. And then secondly. Can you talk a little bit about how you manage this tension, inevitably, that you find with uh, funders in particular about wanting hard data about impact uh, and accountability in this context? Yeah, those are great questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, first about sort of the difference between developmental evaluation and other forms of evaluation. I should just come clean um, off the bat that when we engaged in this work with the Gates Foundation, we did not refer to it as developmental. <clears throat> what made us realize that it was a developmental evaluation was when we began to listen to how people were sort of um, interpreting, if you will, the, those buckets of the hunch of change. Um, and it made us realize that there was no, um, no real, no real, not a fully developed model yet. The, the actual intervention was just being formed. There were some hypotheses that people had, um, but the intervention had not been formed. So I think the biggest distinguishing factor for me, and it, I, just, like Hallie said, there's sort of different interpretations and there's a whole spectrum. But for me, the biggest distinguishing factor is developmental evaluation is particularly appropriate when it is part of your responsibility to co-craft the intervention using real-time information, using contextual information, uh, formal and informal processes to sort of help craft that program or that intervention. Again, I sort of go back to that um, you know, refining of a, of, a, of a new product in the business sector. There's a lot of prototyping that happens. So I tend to think about developmental evaluation as that time to prototype a social intervention. Um, and then, you know, once you have a strong, and the, and the other thing that I want to underscore is unlike any other evaluation where you might make some sort of changes to um, measures or to t uh, assessment tools sort of on the periphery, uh, developmental evaluation in some cases completely uh, you know, negated some tools that we thought we were going to use or completely recrafted measures as folks we were doing the work on the ground. So, you know, we put sort of a, a stick in the, in the sand, if you will, saying this is what we're going to be looking for, and within three months' time we had already refined those measures because they were not appropriate. So the other distinguishing factor is as a result of developmental evaluation, you should also have a much stronger appropriate uh, set of measures that you can use in a formative or summative evaluation. So those are just sort of the, the two distinguishing factors that I jump to. Um, in terms of the, you know, the tension with wanting um, hard evidence fast, um, we all know how, um, how decisions are made in the social sector and in philanthropy. Uh, you know, we do need to be accountable um, and there is an urgency uh, around many of the issues that we're working on. 
And I can tell you that not just in this engagement, but in every single engagement, just like John said and Hallie, there is definitely a, um, a learning curve to help people understand um, what this kind of evaluation can bring to bear. And again, I often think about, you know, before we go out and scale an intervention, before we replicate, before we even um, uh, elevate lessons learned for the field, let's do a little bit more of a deeper dive to really figure out what the elements of the intervention could be, under which conditions are they most likely to be successful. Um, and that, that Again, that sort of R&D approach does have some resonance, right, because it is a smarter way, potentially, to use resources. It's better to learn uh, early on in the stages. And Hallie, I think your timeline is exactly right. I should also say, while this evaluation is ongoing, I think probably the developmental aspect of it, and there's no clear-cut line. I can't tell you that it was as of March 2011. Um, but, you know, I think somewhere between the first six to nine months of the initiative was that developmental stage, and then we slowly began moving into a formative stage. So the other sort of, you know, messaging here is, this is not going to be a five-year developmental initiative, right? There are going to be critical things that we learn early on that will help not only inform and make this an inv investment more impactful and smarter, but when we shared some of the early lessons that we learned during the planning phase, um, in this case with the foundation, there were some real ahas about some of the things that we've learned that had implications for other investment strategies that were completely unrelated to the community partnerships portfolio. So you can also build sort of rapid value for a developmental evaluation approach by sharing some of the real-time lessons and refinements that you're seeing folks make because they may have application in other settings. Now, it's also the, the, the last thing that I'll say on this point is um, the tension to show student level progress was never fully alleviated. I do have to say that many of the sites, many of the seven sites that were implementing this initiative through Gates Funding had, were in near real time collecting student level data um, to, to monitor, if you will, how some of the uh, interventions and policy changes that they were testing were faring. These were not whole scale control randomized studies, but these were um, some I don't even want to say pilots because in some instances they were fairly large uh, policy changes, but there was student level data that we tried to collect through the sites, not ourselves, but the sites were collecting these data points, and that we tried to um, message and circle back to the foundation to be able to at least say, these are the directions that the sites are going, and this is the evidence that we currently have at the student level that we think these are the right directions to be going, and these are the conditions under which they're thriving. You know, um, it, this is an interesting question, and it, it brings up a lot of the kind of politics that are very real tensions between um, just um, among funders themselves and what kinds of questions boards are asking, et cetera, but also between nonprofits and, and funders who have might have differing ideas about what impact they're having and where those outcomes should show up. And I wonder, to John, from a funder's perspective, uh, and drawing on the specific example of your experience in Youthscape, how do you make decisions about how information and lessons kind of flow up the chain uh, t given that sensitivity, the sort of political sensitivity between people on the ground and people making funding decisions? Right. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, I think what's it, what it, it's worth sketching out how it was structured. Uh, in each of the communities, this, there was a local developmental evaluator, and this is important, which was co-funded by the local coalition and the foundation. And in fact, so there. Their both accountability and responsibility was as much, and I would argue more, to the local coalition than it was to the foundation. So, for example, if they got that information uh, washing the dishes, their method of dealing with it, you know, for us, writing a report up to us was, was not important. It was how does it improve the local performance, and the faster the better. Um, so that was how it would be fed at that loop. Now, here's the, here's the twist. There also was a national coach, a national developmental evaluator, who had 
weekly check-ins with the developmental evaluators across the country and also did community visits from time to time. And it was his responsibility to decide what needed to be fed up the chain. So for example, I don't need to know that such and such an uh, event has happened or there's this misunderstanding or, or this type of project was not working at this one community level. But the minute there starts to be a pattern showing up across the system, that both the national backbone organization and the funder need to be aware of because perhaps there's a there's a course correction in the funding formula perhaps there's a course correction in as i mentioned what we should be focusing on um, youth um, serving organizations as opposed to developing youth skills and it was his job to feed that to us and how did that happen well <laughs> You'll, you may laugh at this, but in fact, I walk to work every day, and I walk by where he lived, and we had a check-in while he was at the bus uh, letting, getting his kids off to school. <laughs> of course, we had phone calls and, you know, formal more sit-downs, but very often that we scheduled that for the day after his call with them, and those type of just as the, the effective developmental evaluators in the community would have regular, you know, the day after the dishwashing thing would be going for coffee with the leader of the organization saying, you know, I just want to surface this. I would have the same thing with the national DE. Obviously, it had to be documented because there were other people involved in decision making across the country. But um, it, ours was focused very much on the robust um, feedback loops that could actually take effect and not wait for somebody to write a report. They would then go up the chain over weeks and months, and by then it was probably too late. We did document, in, as you, if you've seen our website, a lot about the process of development, developmental evaluation, but less about the content about what was going on in the communities. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I'm wondering if, uh, Hallie, you might be willing to tackle a question about um, this idea of rigor and and uh, how do you talk about rigor when you're thinking about developmental evaluation? It seems sometimes when we talk about it that there's a lot of squishiness in there. How do you think about um, both rigor from a data collection side and, and other aspects of rigor? Thanks, Ty. I, I, I love this question. I love the conversations you and I had about this question um, as we wrote the, the white paper. Um, I think, you know, there, it's, it's how we define rigor, first of all, and I think oftentimes we um, evaluators and, and, and others look at rigor in terms of quantitative data and look at the methodology and the technical aspects of the data collection and analysis. Um, so first I want to say that developmental evaluators should always collect data with um, as much technical accuracy as possible and certainly around professional standards of collection and analysis. And what that means is, you know, being, you know, having some sense of why you're collecting the data um, and from whom you're collecting the data and, you know, being um, culturally responsive and, and all these, you know, really important things around a rigor and data collection. But also I want to talk about rigor is not only quantitative data and how the quantitative data are collected, it's also we want to apply rigor to qualitative data. So systematically collect and analyze that in, again, professional ways. But when we talk about developmental evaluation, we think rigor can also be defined in another way. And it's, it has to do with what's the rigor of our engagement with the with, the, um, with the, the participants in the evaluation? How are we thinking about accountability? Because rigor and accountability are often commingled. Um, and that we think about the rigors really in terms of what's our accountability to learning and what kind of rigor can we bring to thought processes and the sense-making process. And then, of course, the rigor to the use of the information. So it's, you know, developmental evaluation isn't about the specific methods because it employs very similar methods as the formative evaluation and, and many summative evaluations. So it's going to be collecting, you know, data through interviews and surveys and observation and some, using some other methodologies as photography and, and appreciative inquiry and, and looking at social media. So all those methods are employable. Those DE often uses social network analysis and systems mapping in addition. But the, we should always go for the data that makes, you know, that, that are relevant, that are useful, and that are collected in culturally appropriate ways. But we also need to hold ourselves as, as 
in terms of the rigor of how we help process and facilitate the learning around that information. Tanya, I know you might have some additional thoughts on that, so I want to invite you to speak to that if, if I haven't covered everything. Um, no, I actually think that's a great response, um, and I, I hope that the folks in the audience, as they, as they hear that kind of common uses of terms like accountability and rigor, when they're negotiating whether this is the right approach, um, to really push one another to think about and talk openly about, well, what is it you mean by accountability and how does it fit in this circumstance and what does rigor mean when you have an adaptive approach so that we become more, as a sector, we become more adept at having that conversation in a, in a very open way and everyone starts with the same kind of expectations. Agreed. Um, and we only have five minutes left, so I want to do, get in two sort of quick last questions, um, although they're both difficult to answer quickly. Um, the first one is to Meg. Meg, could you just give one or two very concrete examples of um, methods, evaluation methods you had to try and abandon or, or indicators you had to t try and abandon and how, what you did instead? Yes. <laughs> there were there were several, but um, let me give a very concrete one. So as I mentioned, one of the, um, the, the sort of tenets behind this investment was that you had to build commitment um, for a completion agenda. We never said whose commitment, how, and why, okay? So the site sort of tackled that issue on their own, and while we, uh, you know, while they were tackling the issue on the ground, we were trying to think about, okay, how would you measure that, that, that a community has taken up an agenda? And one of the things we said, well, we should really do a media scan and really start tracking how, how issues of um, post-secondary completion are covered on local markets. Well, the truth is that may have worked in only one or two of the communities who took on, as part of their commitment building effort, a broad-based uh, community uh, messaging campaign. That was not what the majority of the sites um, invested their funds in. Most of them, the issue of completion was already on the agenda. So that's a very specific example of a methodology that we thought, what a great way to measure commitment. And it turned out that not only was it not a great measure because people were not uh, trying to build uh, the community commitment through sort of public media outreach, um, but it probably would have showed um, uh, either some successes or challenges around a community adopting the completion agenda because of the pre-existing environment, whether this was already a topic uh, on, on the dockets of the local media um, or if this was something that was um, not covered at all. So it's a very specific um, methodology. There are also some um, methods that we uh, looked at that were secondary data analysis methods um, that initially we thought we, we could sort of track uh, sort of trends around college-going rates in these communities, um, and particularly with focused on community colleges. That was a focus for the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, but as it turned out, the work, the methods that the sites were employing and the data that they were collecting that I mentioned earlier was much more robust, was much more telling, and much more applicable uh, for, for what we needed that data for, which is to figure out are we heading in the right direction to make long-term, large-scale impact. Excellent. Thank you. That was helpful. Um, okay, so the last question goes to John. Um, we have a lot of nonprofits on the phone uh, with us, and as well as evaluation officers and program officers within foundations who may find themselves having to make the case to either their funder or to the folks above them in the foundation for trying developmental evaluation, for, for using developmental evaluation instead of another approach that might not be as good a fit for, for the intervention. Can you just give some advice to, to the audience uh, about how to help make that case within your own organization or to funders when DE is appropriate? Okay, I think the first thing uh, that I would say that it's not instead of other approaches, because I think that's going to actually get yourself in trouble. Um, you're still going to want people who want accountability measures at specific times within an initiative. But I think where it can be useful is that our experience is that many community organizations have low expectations about the value of evaluation. Um, and they'll, they've told us things like it's a waste of time, or they told us what we already knew, or that evaluators are more interested in methodological rigor rather than usefulness, or that the evaluation was great, but it came too late to be used. And so I think the case to be made for it is particularly around 
um, learning that if we acknowledge, this is part of framing it in a larger context, if we acknowledge that we do not have a roadmap that we're following, but in fact that we have a compass of where we want to go, and that developmental evaluation can be a way of calibrating that compass to making sure that we're all going in the same direction and surfacing those issues uh, in humility that we know that in fact we are actually going to refine our strategy as we go. It's not strategy, then action, then evaluation. It's actually you test things, you prototype them, and your strategy only becomes clear as you go along. That if you accept that as the way that social change is likely to happen in a complex situation, then you probably need a tool that is more robust and timely than some of the other forms of evaluation. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, thanks to everybody on the line. We had more than 250 participants and uh, more than 100 fantastic questions, which is amazing. We'll keep working uh, to answer those and interact with each other, and we'd love to hear your ideas as we are still learning about developmental evaluation and what it looks like in practice. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. There's a brief electronic survey you'll get after the event, which we'd love it if you'd give us real-time feedback on, on this experience. And please check out the websites that are on, the, on this last slide here for more information and a continued conversation. You can access both the recording and download the slides from the webinar uh, at the FSG site that's listed there on the last, the last slide. So thank you again for all your wonderful contributions, uh, uh, both in the audience and on the panel. And we hope to continue this conversation. Have a great day, everybody.